uh, the Marseille Electromagnetism and Optics uh, Student Association is happy to welcome you at our webinar Optics and Renewable Energy. Uh, this webinar is uh, the third we organize and we hope you will enjoy it. And today we have uh, three speakers. Uh, the first talk will be given by Dr. Klaus Jäger from the Helmholtz uh, Center Berlin. Uh, Klaus did his PhD in Delft University of Technology Netherlands, working on the theory and simulations related to optimization of in-film solar cells. Then he did postdoctoral research related to photovoltaic solar energy uh, in both private and uh, uh, public uh, sector in Netherlands. And now he is a postdoctoral researcher in the uh, Helmholtz Center in Berlin and a part of a uh, physicist young investigator group, Nano Sippe. Apart from his research, Klaus is actively involved into the outreach activities discussing energy conversion technologies with general public, uh, and especially focusing on photovoltaic solar energy. And today he will give uh, an extended talk entitled Photovoltaic Solar Energy, Global Perspectives, Recent Developments, uh, and the Role of Optics. Thank you very much um, for your audience. I am very happy to talk to you today. Um, in the next half hour or so, I will give a very broad overview on solar energy, global perspectives, what happened in recent time, and especially the role of optics. And I decided to make it very general. So my talk will have seven chapters starting very general with the role of sun and earth and the role of humans in this, the climate crisis and how solar energy can be a solution. And then in the second half, I will especially focus on the role of optics, discuss what light management means and by facial solar cells in the very end. So let's start with chapter one on sun and earth. And you all know about the greenhouse effect and this means that sunlight reaches the uh, earth and a part of the heat, so infrared radiation is reflected back into the sky and some gases in the atmosphere, especially carbon dioxide, water vapor and methane absorb the um, heat radiation. And therefore it's trapped in the atmosphere and this leads to uh, a temperature increase. And especially the role of optics is a very old or very well known effect. Already Svantia Arrhenius, a Swedish scientist, uh, theoretically described how CO2 in the atmosphere can lead to a greenhouse effect in 1896, so more than 120 years ago. And this effect is very, very important. So if we wouldn't have any greenhouse effect, the equilibrium temperature on the surface of the Earth would be minus 17 degrees. So life would not be possible. However, uh, because of the greenhouse gases, um, the equilibrium temperature is something more like 15 degrees. And this means that water is liquid. And this again means that uh, life is possible. So we really need a natural greenhouse effect for life to be possible. Now let's have a look on the temperature on the planet in the last 400,000 years. Um, so this is a little bit a strange graph because this is now and the further we go to the right, the more we go into the past. And we see that especially the last 10,000 years were very, very stable. They were more stable than any other period in the last 400,000 years. And some people think that this even can have to do with the influence of humans that already prevented a cooling of the atmosphere for seven or eight thousand years. I already heard people calling this our Garden of Eden, where we have been in the last 10,000 years. And this period is called the Holocene. Now let's take a closer look at the role of humans. 
Um, as you all know, humans use a lot of energy and about 86% of this energy is used uh, is fossil energy, mainly gas, coal, and oil. And what we are doing when we uh, use this fossil fuel, it's like discharging a battery, which we cannot recharge. And Wim Sinke, who is a Dutch solar energy researcher, uh, put this um, in a very pointy graph, saying, we live in a remarkable age driven by fossil fuels. And this is more or less where we are now. So it is very important that we realize in which special times we are living. I also would like to point out that humans do not only emit CO2 because they use energy. Actually, electricity and heat generation only counts up for one quarter of our total human CO2 emissions. Another quarter has to do with deforestation and agriculture. And a bit more than 20% is industry, 14% transport. And also buildings, so mainly concrete, is 6%. So also, uh, uh, for example, by switching from concrete to uh, wooden buildings, could, include, could decrease global greenhouse gas emissions. And now let's have a look on what this means. So in this graph, which is from NASA, you can see uh, the CO2 content in the atmosphere during the last 800,000 years. And you see it went up and down. And then the low points, these were during the ice ages. And when the CO2 was high, this was during the periods when we had warm periods. But in the last 800,000 years, so it's a very long time, CO2 in the atmosphere never was higher than 300 parts per million. And this is what we have done in the last decades. So last month, uh, we had something like 417 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. And you see that what we did in the last uh, decades is something very special. Uh, to conclude this, it means we shifted the atmosphere into a state which humankind has never seen before. This already brings me to chapter three of my, um, my talk on the climate crisis. And on this, so on this graph, you see the temperature on many countries on the Planet. I do not know whether it's all countries, but many. And when you have a large blue point, it means that it was cooler than in the reference period between 1951 and 1980. And when it's very red, it was warmer. So zero, so like here, it means that in 1880, in Ethiopia, for example, we had a very uh, average year compared to the 1951 to 1980. Average. And now let's have a look. Um, now let's have a look to what happened since then. See, around 1900, a few years were warmer than average, some others were cooler than average, but it was a pretty balanced ratio. Two years and reddish years. And you see, especially starting now around 1980, that it's predominantly orange and red. And in this millennium, it gets even more dramatic. And when we put this together in a graph, so here we have the global mean average temperature. This is also data from NASA. And what you see, is that the last five years, 2014 to 2019, were the warmest years ever measured. So since around 1980, the global temperature only knows one direction, and this is up. And of course, as you all know, the consequences are wildfires, droughts, storms, 
and many other consequences, which would be the topic of a whole other talk. So I will now try to go directly to solutions and not discuss. So let's have a look on solar energy. And first, let's have uh, a look on how much solar power we actually would have. And this little red cube represents the, the total human primary energy consumption in one year. When we now look at different renewable energy sources, we see that, for example, with hydro, we could more or less generate as much energy as humans consume. Uh, with biomass, we could probably generate around 20 times as much. So this is okay, but it's not that convincing. Wind, on the other hand, already looks pretty much more convincing. So with wind alone, we probably could fulfill humans' energy needs 200 times. And then we now look on solar, and only on the continents, we see that we have by far more solar energy than humans ever need. So this is a very optimistic picture. But how much solar energy? Um, the, there's a question, what is the primary consumption? So you use electricity or energy in your house, for example, as electricity. Um, but to generate one kilowatt hour of electricity, for example, with coal, you need more than one kilowatt hour of coal because um, a coal power plant only has um, a coal power plant only has something like 40% efficiency, meaning that you need something like 2.5 kilowatt hours of energy in coal to produce one kilowatt hour of electricity. And the primary energy is all the basic needs like coal, uh, gas, oil. So this is the energy without all the, 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 the losses we have to generate it into other forms, of, to convert it into other forms. So we have seen that we have a huge potential of wind and solar. On the other hand, when we look how much energy actually was generated by photovoltaics, so photovoltaic solar energy with solar cells in 2018, it's only 0.3%. And also with wind, it's only 0.7%. There is a lot of uh, potential that we can use. And now let's go more directly into solar energy and solar modules can directly convert sunlight into electricity and they have no moving parts. So they just can be used as a roofing material like on this roof in an alpine hut in the north of Italy. And of course, you also can do this in a city like Berlin. And when we now look at the areas which we would need to supply humankind with electricity, there is a work from the German Aerospace uh, uh, Center, TLR, from 2005. And you see three squares in the Sahara. So this very little square, this little area would be sufficient to supply all of Germany with electricity. Back then, the European Union had 25 members, now there are 28, if I'm not wrong. Uh, so this also would not need that much energy. And to supply the whole world with energy, it only would be a square with a side length of something like seven or 800 kilometers. So this seems very doable. And there are many studies that look uh, on, okay, how could the world completely driven by renewable energy look like? And for example, there is this study from Jacobson and co-workers from 2017. Um, here, I think the, the efficiency here, there are already some efficiency factors included. So it's all realistic. So now let's have a look at the 2050 energy scenario. And they come up. And that, so this is something, of course, which is a very important message for politics uh, to switch to completely renewable energy by 2050. In their study, it would create 52 million jobs 
but only something like 27.7 million jobs would be lost. And this 100% renewable energy system would be mainly driven by solar. Here we have residential rooftop, big solar plants, some concentrated solar plants, and also quite some solar on commercial or government buildings. And the second big energy carrier would be wind. And then we have only very small percentage of geothermal, hydroelectric, and tidal turbine. So the key message here is, actually it will be solar and wind, which with current technologies have the potential to, to run the world completely on renewable energy. Now let's take another look at solar. And when we look on how much photovoltaic, so how many solar panels were installed, you see that we had an enormous growth in the last decades. So until around 2017, the annual growth rate of totally installed PV capacity was 40%, which means that uh, the, the, uh, solar, the amount of solar panels installed doubled almost every two years. However, when we look at the last years, 2017, 18, and 19, suddenly the exponential growth seems to have stopped, which means that this almost looks like a linear phase. And if this continues in the next years, it would be very dramatic because we would need 30 times the total photovoltaic production capacity we have currently to be able to provide uh, Earth with, global, with solar energy. So we really need to go on with uh, of exponential growth for quite some time. And when we only would have a linear development in the next years, this would mean that probably we cannot reach the goals which we must reach. Another good thing is here you see the module average selling price as a function of the cumulative global shipments. So this is a so-called learning curve. So it means when you have produced 10 times as many solar modules, the price always falls by a certain factor. And what you see here is that it became really, really cheap. For example, in 2000, one watt of solar power from a solar module costed something like three dollars and in 2015 it was below one dollar so we have seen a rapid price decrease here in recent years and this goes on because here we just have a technology development just one word about technology Currently, most solar cells, I think about 90% or even more, are made from silicon. And the efficiency limit of conventional silicon solar cells is 29.4%. And with this, I finished the first part of my talk, which was a general part uh, about climate and, and the role of energy. And now I will, in the second half, go more into details looking at the role of optics, discuss what light management means with the example for perovskite silicon solar cells, and then if we have time, also talk a bit about Now let's talk about the role of optics. Therefore, I first would like to introduce the, the, the term of light management. And as you all can understand, when we want to maximize the efficiency of the solar cell, we need to maximize the total amount of light that is absorbed in the solar cell. And all the technologies and techniques which we can use to maximize the amount of the absorbed light are called light management. And the aim of light management is twofold. First, we would like to reduce reflection at the front side. So the front, the solar cell should become less reflective, so it should become more black. This also is that we want to enhance in coupling. Um, 
I will come back to the questions at the end now because I get now questions from a few slides earlier. So I suggest that we just go on with the talk and answer the uh, answer the questions at the end. Is this okay, Elena? Uh, yes, yes, it's uh, better this way. And now people write questions, and then in the end we will give them the word to ask. Okay, perfect. So the second part of light management is also that we want to increase the absorption because when we have absorber materials which do not absorb much light, like silicon in the infrared, we need to increase the light path uh, by different techniques and this we call light trapping. So to summarize, light management means that we want to have in-coupling of light into the solar cell and that we want to trap the light in the solar cell in the absorber layer. And one technique that we can use textures and nanotextures that we can use for light trapping is nano imprint lithography. And here we start with some master and the master already carries the shape that we want to replicate. And from the master, we make a stamp from a material called PDMS. And this PDMS, we press into some salt shell onto glass substrate, and then we have some UV curing of the salt shell. And then uh, we, this UV curing hardens the salt shell. We can remove the PDMS stamp, and the structure of the master is now replicated on the glass substrate. And this allows us to have make textures with arbitrary designs. And in our lab, we have um, demonstrated areas up to 10 by 10 square centimeters. Now I would like to talk about light management for perovskite silicon tandem cells. And for this, I first have to tell you what tandem solar cells are. And as I told you already a few slides ago, most solar cells currently are made from silicon and the theoretical efficiency limit of this technology is 29.4%. And here on the right hand side, you see in gray, the, the energy, uh, the energy of the, the, spectra, ener the spectral energy of the light we receive from the sun. And in red, you see the light the amount of light or the amount of energy that can be utilized by a silicon solar cell. And here the problem is that, for example, here, so the band cap of uh, silicon would be 1.1 electron volt, which is at a wavelength of 1100 nanometer. But when I now have lower wavelengths uh, or higher, or when I now have a shorter wavelengths like here, at 550 nanometers, um, then the photon has twice as much energy as can be utilized by the silicon material. And this is a huge loss, which we call thermalization, and it is about 33%. And we now put another material like perovskites on top of silicon. And this material, when it has a higher band gap, we can utilize the high energy photons here more effectively and we can reduce the thermalization. And therefore, combining two solar cells with different materials, which is what we do in a tandem solar cell, is a very good idea. And so this has been done for some years. So colleagues from us at HCB in a collaboration with EPFL in Switzerland had the first pretty good tandem solar cell with perovskite and silicon in 2016 with 18%. Now let's see what we can do when we have light trapping. And we did some optical simulations. So here we have a simulation of a solar cell where we assume that we only have planar interfaces, so no roughness at all. And here you see the absorption profile in green. You see the amount of light that is absorbed in perovskite and in blue the amount of light is absorbed by silicon. And we can calculate 
to which current density in the solar cell this would translate. And for these kind of tandem solar cells, because of electrical reasons, it is very important that the two current densities are the same, because the lower one also determines uh, the current density in the other solar cells. So even though if here in the perovskite top cell around 20 milliamps of electricity could be generated, only 13 milliamps could go through because the rest would be blocked by the bottom. So we need something that's called current match. And you see that we here have quite some absorption losses and reflection losses. Now we did some optimization, purely with planar interfaces as well, but we optimized the thicknesses and we optimized the materials. And this means that we could push the, the, the overall current density from 13 to around 18 milliamps per square centimeter. And this was without any texture. Now we look what happens when we texture at the back. And already told you earlier, silicon has a very low absorption in the infrared. And this is because it is an indirect uh, band gap material. And by roughening the backside, uh, the, 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 the long wavelength slide is scattered at the back and has a longer path through the silicon, which means that absorption in the silicon can be increased. And this helps us to push the, the, the current density from 18.5 to 19.5 milliamps. So this already is very promising. And this is also something that colleagues um, at HCP realized in experiment. So they had a perovskite silicon solar cell, which only was planar on the front side, but rough at the back side. And with this, they could uh, realize a efficiency of 23.4%. Now let's see what can do what we can do when we add other textures with nano imprint lithography. And with nano imprint lithography, they made some light management foil, which had, which looks like big pyramids, and they put this on top of the solar. And this had an anti-reflective effect. So here you see again the results we have seen two slides earlier, with the rough texture on the back, but a planar front side. And when we now have the light management foil with the pyramids on top, we can strongly increase the amount of light that reaches the solar cell, and we can push the efficiency from 23.4 to 25.5. Still, the perovskite layers are planar now, and we also can have a look what happens when we also make them uh, rough. And this was something which we did with rigorous optical simulations, because this is something that we cannot yet really realize in lab, or there are first signs, but it's difficult, so we first started this with simulations. And as textures, we used here hexagonal sinusoidal nanotextures. And here you see the result of this numerical study. Uh, and what you mainly see is that by going from a planar reference to a nanotextured cell, the reflection losses can be reduced by 50%. And we also see in the lab that texturing a silicon wafer can strongly reduce the reflection of a silicon wafer. And we also see that it doesn't make a big difference whether we have small sign structures or large pyramids. And we also see that when we have a perovskite cell, which we make on a textured glass substrate, that also here the current density, which means the amount of light that is absorbed, can be increased. And we have also a very high lab record, in, uh, which was made by colleagues at HCB in Steve Albrecht's lab. And there the record is currently 29.15%, which already is very close to the theoretical limit of silicon alone. And when you look, this cell doesn't even have all the light management tricks front, 
only the rough tax rate back. So if we with this cell with already very high efficiency, have 29.15%, uh, then when we also have nano tax rate on the front side, we even can increase the efficiency. And so now, Elena, I could now talk a little bit about bifacial cells as well for three or four minutes. Should I do this or should I come to a conclusion now? Uh, well, uh, yeah, it's up to you to decide. Yeah, I guess we have uh, three or four minutes. Okay, then I will talk about this interesting concept as well. So until now, I told you about perovskite silicon solar cells, where this tandem concept is one of the strategies that we can use to boost or to make the efficiency of solar cells higher. Another way to increase the energy output of solar cells is to go to bifacial. And what does this mean? So a standard silicon solar cell has a metallic back complex usually made from aluminium. However, nowadays it's also possible to have not only the front transparent, but also the backside transparent. And I only also can utilize the light that reaches the, so, uh, the solar cell from the back, for example, which is reflected from the ground or which just comes as diffuse light from the sky. And the, the prospect of this technology is very, very uh, positive. So the so-called International Technology roadmap, roadmap for Photovoltaic assumes that bifacial silicon solar cells will have a market share of 60% by 2029. So this is something that really has a big market now. And we made an illumination model for uh, uh, bifacial solar cells. And here we have a big, so this would be all solar modules in a big field. And to have a detailed illumination model, we need to include the direct sunlight that hits the module, but also the light from the sky that hits the module. And you have to see that this angular range presents a wedge. You also have to assume the light that can reach the solar module from the ground. And these components we do not only need to consider on the front side, but also on the back side. And we have to take a closer look at the light that hits the ground, because this consists from two components. The first would be the direct sunlight hitting the ground here in these orange areas, and the diffuse light hitting the ground, which, for example, for this point can come from three different areas. And here, um, you see now one example. You see that in June, for example, large fractions of the ground are illuminated throughout the day, while in November, hardly any light can reach the ground because the sun is always at a very low angle. And another feature of our model is that it also calculates where on the mo how much energy reaches which part of the module, so along the module. And one of the results, so we calculated many things here, one of the results was we, for example, looked at data for Seattle, and we saw that throughout the year, around 13% of all the energy that can reach the um, module comes from the back. So meaning, um, Compared to a module that only can utilize light from the front side, um, light at the back side uh, can boost the solar cell energy output by something like 30-40%. Now let me bring to my conclusions. So I hope that I could convince you that solar energy will play a major role in a carbon-free global economy. And I tried to explain to you that optics can help us to increase the amount of sunlight which is absorbed in the solar cell. This is called light management. Tandem solar cells allow to surpass uh, the efficiency limit of standard silicon solar cells. Perovskites are a promising material class for these tandem solar cells combined with silicon. And I talked a little bit about bifacial solar modules, which can utilize the light in both sides. And as last slide, I would like to show this. Uh, which is called the large acceleration 
and you saw how many different aspects of human life have an exponential growth in the last decade. And we have only one planet and exponential growth at one point reaches the limits of the planet. So we have your population, population in cities, energy use, paper production, tourism, and so on. And also many values, many values that we can measure in the atmosphere grow exponentially, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, uh, domestic land use, which seems here to flatten out a bit anyway, nitrogen in the coastal zone, and so on. And with this, I would like to thank you. The scientific results I showed to you were uh, obtained at two groups, which is the group I'm a member of, which is Christiane Becker's group, Nano Optics for Solar Energy. And the experimental results on perovskite silicon tandem salts, whereby Steve Albrecht's perovskite silicon tandem solars are included. And I would like to finish my talk with a quote, which is the greatest shortcoming of the human race is our inability to understand the exponential. With this, I would like to thank you for your all. Uh, thank you very much for your talk, Klaus. Uh, we have uh, several questions, and uh, the first question we will, uh, is from Valentina. Can you hear me? Yes, hello. Okay, well, it was just a very basic question at the beginning. I was wondering the graphs that you were showing in which uh, were showing the CO2 in the atmosphere or the temperature of like 100,000 years ago, how is it possible to measure or to predict the temperature or the CO2? Um, so first of, all, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm not a climate scientist, so it's not my expertise. But for example, the CO2 emissions in the past, they can trace, they, they, they make, uh, 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 they drill deep holes into Antarctica, for example, and there they have ice which is 10 or hundreds of thousands of years old. And with some methods, they can determine how old the ice at a certain depth is, and they can analyze the air in little bubbles within the ice. And so they can, uh, for example, calculate how CO2 in the atmosphere was a long time ago. Actually, I'm not sure about, um, about how they determine the temperature, but they're also similar. There, I think there are several methods that are available to them for determining the temperature records in past year, in past millennia. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, the next question is from uh, Faris. What is the human primary consumption? consumption? Okay, I tried to answer this. So people talking about energy economy distinguish between primary and secondary energy. And primary energy would be, for example, coal, gas, also the direct energy carriers that we use. And when we convert, for example, coal into electricity, we lose something. So as I try to explain, for example, the best coal power plants have an efficiency of maybe a bit more than 40%, meaning from, I think it's 2.5 kilowatt hours of energy in coal, I get one kilowatt hour of electricity. So then the primary energy use would be 2.5 kilowatt hours, but the secondary energy here as electricity would be only one kilowatt hour. So secondary energy is the form of energy we really consume, and primary energy is the energy carried in the original energy carrier. Uh, the, the, the next uh, question is from Pritu. Pritu, would you like to ask it? Yeah, so about the... Um you talked about perovskites and kind of organic solar cells and stuff. So as I understand, they have uh, some limited lifetime. And after that, they are like a waste. So you in, we are increasing, you know, production of these, but so there's no clue about uh, how to manage the waste, which will be produced by solar cells. Um, I think we don't really have perovskite solar cell um, production yet. There are companies that try to do it. And I agree. While silicon is an extremely stable material, there have been solar modules working for more than 30 years stable. Perovskite has more stability issues, so it's a big, it's a big part in research. For example, Antonio Abate's group here at Helmut Zentrum Berlin uh, does research on the stability of perovskites. And if 
they do not manage to get the material so stable that it also can survive for 20 or more years, which is the lifetime of a solar module, then it will not make it into the market. Um, about waste, I think anyway, the, the amount of waste here is very little because the absorber layer is very, very thin. Also, when you look at standard solar modules, the main material of a solar module would be the aluminium frame and the glass carrier. So when you just look at the weight compo the co components of a solar module, it's mainly aluminium and glass and even the, the, the solar cells, which have thicknesses of maybe 200 micrometers, only have a very little fraction of, of, of um, weight. Still, of course, recycling is a very um, relevant topic. And if the solar energy industry wants to become really sustainable, which I think they must become, then it also means that they have to take recycling and development of recycling technologies very serious. And I really also hope that policymakers uh, make regulations that uh, force uh, solar cell makers to produce only pro products that can be recycled very well, because otherwise we end up with big problems. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. A question from Toma. Does exponential growth of solar energy production assume infinite resources, or is it still reasonable to set this growth as an achievable goal? Can you see this curve? So this would be a typical S-shape. So, so every technology has first a very quick growth, which is can be well described by exponential, and then at some point it will flatten out and we will reach some saturation. And uh, it's actually similar to what we now see this corona. You know, we had first exponential growth in almost all countries, and then it flattens out because uh, here of measures the different societies took. Um, and my point was we had exponential growth actually at very low level when you compare when you look at overall human energy consumption until a few years ago and the studies i know is that we would need around 30 times the current actual annual production capacity to be able to have as much solar power pro or solar panels produced by 2050 that we can supply the world with energy with sustainable energy and of course, after that, there will also be a flattening and also we will have a growth. And then in the past, when we have reached equilibrium, the perfect scenario, the amount of solar modules that has to be replaced every year is just as big as the amount, um, as the amount of uh, solar modules that are produced every year. And actually, I think here um, the availability of resources is not really a problem because when we look at silicon solar modules, um, they consist mainly of aluminium in the frame, glass and silicon. And glass is silicon oxide, so burnt silicon. And both silicon and aluminium are amongst the most, uh, the most abundant elements in the, in the Earth's crust. So I don't think that we have any um any issues here the, the other issue that i see is that you know when we do not continue with exponential growth in the next decades that it will be become more and more difficult uh, uh, to replace uh, fossil fuels by solar and wind energy and as you can see when you read the news the, the, the signs of climate change are becoming more and more worrisome with every year so just last month may 2020 was the warmest May ever measured, even though in Central Europe it was pretty chilly, but on the globe it was the warmest month of May ever measured. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the last question from uh, Guillaume de Messi. Are the simulations done at normal incidence or is it integrated over all incidences and polarizations? Um, what we usually did do for... Me so, um, Let's look at standard how solar cells are measured in the lab and what's the industry standard. They only look at normal incidence with unpolarized light. So we usually simulate normal incidence in two polarizations and average across the two polarizations. But I told you in the end, we are now doing more and more work on these bifacial solar cells as well. And there we take into account how much light comes from which direction. And there we also take the directionality. 
account. So in the end, to be able to calculate the, the overall energy yield that you can get from a solar plant, you need to take the direction into account. On the other hand, when you look at the industry standard on how solar modules and solar cells are certified, which is also then uh, uh, what's relevant for our colleagues in the lab, we only look at normal incidence.